Um, I want to talk about this WebVR starter kit. The, this is my favorite project that came out of the fellowship. Um, I was at a film festival talking about um, that data visualization project on a virtual reality panel uh, last fall. And somebody called out from the audience that, okay, there's a panel of five men and you know, women are pretty underrepresented at this conference. Uh, I don't know if anybody's experienced that at any technical conferences or anything. Um, I know it's rare. Uh, and, and you know, we had a discussion about it and it frankly sucks. Um, and and I, I thought we can do better because again, you know, the, the VR, it's this brand new platform. It, you know, it's, it's a new medium. It has so much potential. And are we really going to start yet another medium that's dominated by Silicon Valley and Hollywood and these sort of like, you know, crusty old white guys with, you know, making the same old assumptions about their old business models. And I was like, we, we can do much better about this. And I was thinking about, you know, how do we open it up, not, not just on gender, but on, on sort of many more kind of uh, dimensions of diversity. Um, and I was thinking specifically about income. Uh, and I, I thought it would be an interesting design and engineering challenge to say, how cheap could we make this to not just experience, but to author virtual reality? Um, so uh, how many of you guys know about this thing, right? Google Cardboard, you're all pretty aware of what it is. It's super cool. You take a phone and you drop it in and it becomes a VR headset, right? Because fundamentally, that's what this is anyway. Uh, actually, the DK2, if you take it apart and you open it up, there's a Samsung Galaxy 3 inside. Um, so, you know, you need a small high-res screen and you need, you know, gyrometers and accelerometers and you need a GPU. Um, and that's in this. So it turns out I did a little research. For about $50 to $70, you can get a used Android phone that is just good enough. And another $5, you can get one of these, right, from China. And, you know, it takes six weeks to get here, but it's a piece of cardboard. It's really cheap. So that's great. That's all well and good. And it turns out that a lot of people already have uh, smartphones, you know, because some, for some people it's their only way to get online. You know, even, even in lower income range, especially under the age of 25. Um, so that's great, but what about authoring? I figure if you have maybe, you know, if you're one of these people and, and your smartphone is the only way you can get online, maybe you don't have a computer at home or an internet connection or you have a really old crappy computer at home. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's kind of cheating a little bit to say, oh, well, the Oculus is $350, that's not so bad. But you still have to have a $1,000, $1,500 computer to work with it. You have to have the education that lets you build 3D software. Uh, you have to have access, you know, you have to just know that this, this stuff is available to you. So I figure if all you've got is say a public library computer and you walk in there, what, what can you do with that computer? Like those, I, I don't know last time anybody, you know, went to a public computer lab, they, it's, it's nice that they're there, but they suck because, you know, they're not gonna have Unity Game Engine installed on there. They're not gonna have Unreal, certainly not gonna have Unreal. They're not going to have Android developer tools with the, you know, cardboard SDK even. They're not going to have Xcode, right? You can't even save a file on these things, you know, because as soon as you log out, they, they, they reset it, they wipe it. So what do you do? So I was thinking about this. Um, how many people have heard of JSBin? Do you guys know JSBin? All right. JSBin is great. Um, it gives you this, you've got yourself... Uh, web page. The left side is a text editor. The right side is an iframe. Whatever you write in the text editor instantly gets saved on the server, and it automatically refreshes and uploads. Uh, you know, uploads and refreshes itself. So I can type hello, right, and I can add some HTML, right, and that all works reasonably well. Fine. So what I've got here is I have a script tag that loads up one big chunk of JavaScript. And all I got to do is I drop that into my JS bin. And what this script does is it bootstraps an, ent an empty virtual reality scene, um, which, of course, has nothing in it, so it's all plain and black. But we can come over to the JavaScript panel here. And what this gives me is uh, it uses 3JS, which is the you know, WebGL, one of a, a WebGL wrapper library. Um, 3JS is great, but it's still a bit complicated for somebody who really is a beginner at coding. Um, so I built a, a wrapper API around it that lets you make some really basic objects. Um, the goal here is just to kind of say, look, you're empowered, right? It doesn't have to be you know, production quality. I just want you to be able to build something. So 
one of the commands is vr.floor, right? Okay, so I've got myself a floor. I've typed one line of code. I've got a floor, right? And I can make a box, right? But the box is kind of ugly, so I'm going to do set material wood, right? Oops. And it's buried in the floor, so I'm going to move it up by one meter. And it's boring, so I'm going to vr.animate. And we'll say, oops, we need a reference to the box. And box.rotate on the y-axis by delta. Right, really, really basic, simple. What's not? Oh, thank you. There you go. OK. So I've got myself a rotating box. This is a really, really basic scene. Now, if I'm this kid who you know, is very ambitious but can't afford a computer and I go to the library, I've made this scene. And the scene works fine moving around with the mouse. I can pop this out in the new window. And I can say, I'm going to send this over to my phone. And um, I don't know if anybody can see this URL. I'll paste it for you. If anybody would like to try it, um, you can load this up on your phone, and it'll either respond to your touch to look around, or you can move around with the gyroscope. And if you've got cardboard, you'll see a little button, and it'll do split screen uh, left eye and right eye. And now this thing's working in cardboard. So this, this hypothetical, prototypical kid who's now working at a computer library can now create some basic VR with you know, minimal JavaScript uh, skills. And there's a, there's a whole documented API down here. Um, and all they have to do is send themselves that URL. And the way JSBin works is you just grab the URL, you open it up on a new computer, and you start editing again. And they can send it to their friends. They can send it wherever they want. They're, it's not you know, the best you're going to get out of the Unreal Engine, but it's something. Um, and the nice thing is that it turns out to be a really great prototyping tool. I actually use it all the time. Um, you know, I think there's a lesson here that if you say, well, you kind of create these constraints that maybe don't exist for me, but they exist for somebody else out there. And how do I work within those constraints? How do I solve those problems? And it turns out that there's enormous benefit to me that I don't even, you know, I don't usually operate without those constraints. But you know what? If, you know, I was at Sheffield DocFest the other day and somebody says, well, I don't know, what would this, you think I should build a VR experience? What would this look like? And I go, well, I don't know. Let's pull out the laptop and check it out, right? And in five minutes, you've got a rough mock up. Uh, I use this all the time to experiment with different modes of interaction without having to worry about like really serious art. And you know, even like, you know, making a new GitHub repo and downloading 3JS and getting the boilerplate, even that stuff, as easy as it is, as many times I've done it, it slows you down. Um, and you know, hitting reload slows you down. Um, so I can just kind of go in here and start typing, and I'm making VR. And to go back to this, this kid who's working in the library, let's say this kid makes this thing and publishes it you know, for her friends and shares it. Maybe, you know, maybe he's taking like a, a, you know, an art class or something and they're doing it in a computer art class. And maybe they find their way to, you know, a university or someplace like here. And you go, oh, hey, we've got three Oculus Rifts. I, I really like your work. Let's, let's try it out on the Oculus. And, you know, same software just kind of handles that as well. Um, so it publishes, you know, the, the requirements to create and publish are as close to zero as I can possibly get it. And I'd like to see if I can get it even lower. And the requirements to publish it, and it fits the lowest range possible smartphone and the highest range possible headset. Um, so that's where I'm at with that. Um, I'm, I'm pretty proud of it because I think it, um, it, it comes back again to that theme that we're talking about, about kind of maximum responsiveness. And I, and I try to cover that. You know, it, it works on whatever device you have, whatever input you have within reason, and whatever kind of level of, I mean, not completely, but I attempt to work for a range of education levels and opportunity levels and resource. 
um, and to sort of be responsive in that way beyond just the technical. Um, so I think that's all I have time for. Do we have any other questions? 